Well, I'd like to um, thank Beatrice for inviting me, and, um, and we're going to talk a little bit today about um, some of the research that, that we're doing. And is my volume okay? Is it good? Okay. So um, how many of you have taken immunology? Okay, awesome, right? So, so, I, so, my, so my talk today is not going to be um, extensive immunology, but it, I am going to provide you with all the fundamentals that you're going to need to hear about what we're talking about later on. So I just wanted to make sure that we're guided, um, the talk was appropriate to, to, to who we're talking to. So I provided a present, a talk, a, a title initially, and it was Regulation of Auto-Inflammatory Disease, um, also known as, but, but I actually tweaked the title just a little bit um, to providing a positive influence in the life of a T cell, right? So, you know, if you think about someone being a positive influence in, in someone's life, then Actually, my research is providing a positive influence for T cells. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about T cells and why it's important to provide a positive influence to some of these misguided guys that are causing disease. And he spent tons of time showing me how to, I probably, where do I point? This way? This way? The computers. Yeah. Or... Ha ha, I can do this. I, I'm not. So we've already uh, talked a little bit about this. Um, so I actually got my, uh, my bachelor's degree at University of Florida. And then I um, got my PhD at the University of Florida. And, um, and then I went to UPenn, and that's where I did my postdoc. And then I um, began here at, back at UF in 2007. So they, they must have liked me a little bit. So they, they brought me back here. And um, so basically, as a, as a PhD um, scientist, I studied how cells communicated with each other. And then um, as a postdoc, I began to study how those cells, when they're communicating together, how they influence certain diseases. And I also began to study certain cell types that could either make an immune response more robust or, or dampen it. So we, we studied that balance. And, and now, as we're, um, we came back to UF, then the next goal was to, to see how this communication and these cells, how, they're, they're the, how in combination they actually guide disease resistance or, or susceptibility to autoimmune diseases. So one of the best things that I do before I even uh, get started with the science is that I've, I've been um, a mentor to, to many different students. And I'll, uh, I'll let myself be on the screen for a couple seconds here. Um, so first, I'll, I'll show you my, my mentor as a, as a PhD researcher, um, Howard Johnson. Um, he still comes around, and he pretty much says, you know, you know, he comes in and says, everything you're doing is wrong, Joe. And then I pretty much know that I'm OK, because that's, that's kind of what he does. So this is uh, my, my mentor. And, and these are different generations of, of students. Um, some of my students have gone on to medical school after getting their PhD. Um, some of my undergrads um, have, have now traveled to different places and they're doing, um, becoming, getting their PhD different places. Um, some of my students that make funny faces and things like that, um, she's actually doing a postdoc at Case Western. Uh, she's gone to dental school. Um, he's gone to graduate school. So, so, so we ha I've, I've done, re I've done uh, mentoring at the level of undergrad and graduate, and I, I do have one postdoc in there, but that's kind of where my, my research is, is going. And if I can't do anything else, I mean, being able to help guide in whatever way I can um, the, the, the lives of other students, then, then that actually is something that's very fulfilling, because although I, you know, I might think I'm going to do this for 100 years. Um, the truth is, um, there's going to need to be another generation of people that are doing things. So, so one of the things I do um, is, is try to inspire other people. And so I have this, and it's a disclaimer. <coughs> and so I, I read a quote um, a, a few months ago, and it said that, um, what should you do? It said that you should be the person that you needed 20 years ago. And so um, wherever I go, and if I'm talking to people 1822, yes, um, roughly, 
um, then then this is the thing that that I wanted to kind of share is that um, in my career and in my path, I've, I've made mistakes, right? Quote unquote mistakes. Um, when I look back, I say, well, I should have chosen another path or this wasn't the best way to advance my science. But I kind of learned over time that um, if the mistakes are because you know you took some sort of action, then regardless of whatever the outcome was, it was a lot better than doing nothing, right? So, so if you have a choice to do nothing or to do something that at the time you believe is right, then you should go with the something, right? So, so don't send me a thousand emails saying, you know, I, I, I made, I took an action, it was the wrong one and it's your fault, but, but no, um, but it's, it's been my experience that, um, that, that over time when I've made an action and even if it wasn't the one that might have been the best one and, and so um, as, a, as an undergrad, I, um, I chose my, my school um, based on me liking football, right? So in hindsight, that might have not been the best reason to, to choose a college, right? But in the process of doing that, I got some things out of it. Um, when, I, when I took my postdoc, I, I, I went from being in one defined area of science to a completely different area of science. So it took me a long time to kind of bridge that gap. But by bridging that gap, now I can kind of see things a little bit differently than other people see them, right? So, so if you have the opportunity to m make a choice, then, then make the choice. And if it's the wrong choice, well, now you're gonna look back and figure out, well, why was that the wrong choice? So now it can help guide you to the next place you're going to be. So it's just a thought um, that, that I always share. So going back to science, and you're like, this isn't science, it's still pictures and stuff. But um, we have nurture versus nature. And here are some people, and some of those people are famous. Unfortunately, some of those people are, are infamous, right? Um, and, and so we, we go back and we kind of think and we say, well, what guided them? Um, was it within their genetics? Or was it the way that they were nurtured that, that caused them to become the person that they became? And again, we're, we're talking about biology here. And again, I'm, I'm talking about I'm talking about T cells. I'm almost done, right? Because this is actually T cells here. So we have immune cells, and those immune cells have a genetic predisposition to do certain things. But we can still take those immune cells and tweak them in such a way that if they're on the road to cause autoimmunity, we might be able to do something to them to take them off that road. And, and again, this is my area of, of research. So we know that genetics play a role. If you look at me, um, I'm probably not gonna be an NBA basketball player. No, I can just flat out say I'm not gonna be an NBA pl basketball player because my genetics and my height is going to be a limitation to that. Of course, there were some NBA basketball players. They're really good that, that were about my height, but it makes it harder. Um, getting into school, I mean, of course, intellect plays a role in that. And if someone, is naturally creative, then that's going to help them in their artistic work. But if you have someone that's brilliant and they come to school and they're hungry, then that, that's going to negatively impact their, their, their ability to do work. Um, when I was in Philadelphia, um, I spent a lot of time talking to people that were walking the streets and homeless. I mean, why would I do that? I mean, I guess it talks a little bit about me, but they were asking for money. So you, you think in the back of your mind, well, if they didn't go fight a war for us, then maybe they wouldn't be where they are. Um, what if Shaq never, you might even know who Shaquille, who knows who Shaquille O'Neal is? Oh my gosh, well, that was, I was scared. Um, but if he had never been introduced to basketball, I mean, in fact, people would be, maybe look at, haha, <laughs> look at that big guy, you know, what is he good for, right? But, but, but again, the environment shapes us and helps to make us who we are. And you know, drug dealers, you know, maybe they shouldn't be exposed to crime, maybe they can become a banker, but I don't know if bankers, drug dealers, I mean, it, you know, who's for me to be the judge and, and draw a line, right? So we can fix things. So we can provide food for those kids that are hungry when they go to school, right? Um, students, I mean, parents can teach their kids, even if they're in a negative environment, to be positive. 
Um, teachers, you know, there, if, you know, all of us have deficits in some area, but, but teachers can spend a little extra time with someone to guide them into the path that they were going. So we have an environment, we have genetics, but there are things that we can do to still shape and change things. So the goal of the immune system is to eliminate things that are harmful. Um, just an example, um, we get a cut, you know, a big sh sharp piece of glass or one of my kids puts a toy on the floor and it, and it punctures my, um, my leg, it's happened before, my foot. Um, it also introduces bacteria. So then the immune system um, is traveling through the blood, it comes out and it destroys those pathogens, right? So, so the basic goal of the immune system is to clear those things that are pathogens that can cause us disease. But in some cases, the immune system, instead of targeting those things that are pathogenic, it begins to target our own self tissues. And uh, here are some examples of some autoimmune diseases. So type 1 diabetes um, is, is caused by, is, is, uh, what, what it results in is the destruction of the pancreatic islet cells that make insulin. And when it destroys those, those islet cells that make insulin, then we're no longer able to regulate our blood sugar. So whenever we eat things, we can't use the sugar for energy. It just sits around. So the only way that these people live, and it's actually quite remarkable in some, some a story that I'll tell that maybe if I'm invited again, um, people were able to discover that insulin was, this, uh, was the, the thing that was absent, and, uh, and, and by providing exogenous insulin, these people can now live, which is, which is amazing. Um, systemic lupus is a disease where the, uh, the immune system attacks our, our own DNA. Where's your DNA? Well, your DNA is everywhere. So when you have systemic lupus, the targets are all over your body. Um, some of the main targets are your, your skin, um, and also your, your kidneys. And we'll talk a little bit more about lupus. I actually just came back from a, a lupus conference um, about a week ago. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is another autoimmune disease and uh, multiple sclerosis. And, and there, 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 there are some others. So what are we doing? And I've, I've kind of talked about this. So although we have things like CRISPR, um, our ability to actually change our genetics is still very limited. But if we can nurture the immune system in, in a way that makes it more positive, um, that prevents it from moving towards these autoimmune systems um, settings, um, that's what my lab is focused on. So as I said, the immune system's goal is to eliminate those things that are harmful but at the same time, it also has the role of tolerating self. So I spend a semester teaching immunology, which is still much, much too short. Um, it could probably last for a couple years. I'm going to teach you everything about immunology in the next two minutes, OK? And it's going to be part of. <coughs> The quiz, right? <laughs> okay. So we have um, an immune system. We have an innate side. We have an adaptive side. The innate side are things that stay the same. Um, they're, they're barriers such as the skin, um, having the ability to have, have, if you swallow something, it travels through your mouth down to the other end. So no harm, no foul. If we don't have to fight it, we don't fight it. So, so having these physical barriers in place is something that's important. We also have phagocytic cells, and uh, who knows Pac-Man? Oh my gosh, and you guys don't raise hands. Okay, so Pac-Man was a, was a video game, and it went around, and there was this yellow thing, um, probably parallel graphics by, by your standards, and it would go around, and it, would, it would eat things, right? So in our immune system, we have phagocytic cells, and, and the goal of those cells is to eat things. So if you have bacteria inside your body, they're not supposed to be inside your body, Phagocytic cells eat them. Um, our body can make things like breadcrumbs to help us to identify where those, those, those bacteria are, and we our, those phagocytic cells go travel and eat them. 
We can have cells that are cancerous or we can have cells that are infected by viruses. So phagocytic cells are great when things are on the outside of cells. Natural killer cells are great when things are on the inside of cells. So if they're hiding out on the inside of the cell or if a cell has become cancerous, now a natural killer cell can detect it and, and say goodbye. So it, so it eliminates those cells. We also have things such as complement that are soluble mediators that help make everything go. On the adaptive side, we have T cells, which are going to be a focal point of what we're talking about today, and B cells. Um, when you think of um, <coughs> vaccination, um, the thing that you think about are antibodies, and antibodies are being produced by B cells, and these uh, antibodies that are being produced by these B cells are highly specific to whatever, to whatever you are vaccinated against. So there, there's, uh, there's, so there's B cell immunity, and then there's also some T cell immunity that goes into that adaptive immune response. And, and why is it called adaptive? Well, it has the <coughs> ability to change. So whereas the innate works very, very well at, at looking at classes of problems, um, generalized problems, keeping things out from where they're supposed to be, the adaptive is able to make a tailor-made immune response that's directly targeted to whatever that pathogen is. Or in, in some cases, it can devise an amazing strategy at, at recognizing our own DNA and destroying our own cells, right? It, it can specialize itself in a brilliant way to destroy our pancreatic islet cells. Um, we've, we've worked on uveitis, which is another autoimmune disease, and this inflammation of the uvea, which is part of the eye. So in this case, the immune system is brilliant at, at, at going through the barrier from the, that, that keeps the eye separated from the rest of the body, going into the eye, and actually being one of the major causes of blindness, right? So, so we have this balance, right? We have to be eliminate those things that are pathogenic, but we also have to be tolerant to our own self tissues. And right here at the center are little Y-shaped things. I don't know what they are. So, oh, there's sounds. You guys are you guys are so serious. These are cytokines, um, and cytokines. <laughs> Are the are proteins that are that are the go between. So if you have a phone, and someone calls you, um, cell phones. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, when I was, I didn't get my first cell phone until I think I was 27. Um, uh, but the thing is, is that by the time I got a cell phone, then I was probably the last one of the last people in America to get a cell phone. Um, other people had cell phones. And the only way that, so some people got cell phones, but they didn't have anybody to call, right? <laughs> so cytokines work in a very similar way. So cytokines are messages, but the only way that you can respond to the message is if you have a cell phone. So, so certain proteins are present on T cells and B cells and phagocytic cells, um, and, and these things are known as receptors. So receptors are phone, cell phones, Cytokines are the message. So cytokines are made, send a message to the cells and then tell them to do something. And in a, in, a good, in a perfect world, the things that they tell T cells and B cells and, and T cells and B cells cell macrophages to do are all good things. Um, they tell them to, to respond to that, that pneumococcal infection, you know, respond to that influenza. But in some cases, these cytokines are also driving these autoimmune diseases. So what do you really need for what I'm talking about today? Well, cytokines regulate phagocytic cells. Um, cytokines are made by T cells, but they also regulate T cells. Um, we're not focusing so much on B cells today. But if we have a good communication, then everything is just fine. But if there's a problem, we can target some of these cytokines, right? Because if those T cells never get a bad message, then they're never gonna go on and cause disease, right? If those T cells are somehow held in check, either by regulating the cell phones that they have on them, the receptors, or you can stop them from being fully activated. Now, even though you may have some T cells that could cause disease, if you keep them in check, they never go on to cause disease. So, so this is where 
my research is really uh, focused in is, is controlling the cytokine message and also controlling the T cell responses. And there are lots of words on here, but, but basically um, I'd like for you to take my word for it that, that essentially <coughs> every autoimmune disease is driven in some way by T cells that are not working the, the way that they're supposed to. So fortunately, the immune system has checkpoints in place to keep the immune system working the way that it's supposed to. Um, one thing that it has is that, yes, you have a good start, but you also should have a good finish. So we have an immune system response, uh, immune response that starts, but we also have to turn it off again. So, so that's, a, that's a checkpoint. Um, as I mentioned, we have regulation of the cytokines that are a checkpoint. We have regulation of the certain cells that have the phones that can respond to that. So if they don't have a phone, even though the cytokine's there, they don't respond, right? So that's another checkpoint. So I'm actually going to start here at the bottom, and, and in my talk, I'm actually going to focus on these guys first and then move up to, to these guys just in the, the essence of time today. But we have T cells, but we have a subset of T cells called regulatory T cells that actually turn off the T cells. So they say, okay, well, you've worked long enough. Now it's time to be turned off. So we have regulatory T cells. And as a postdoc, um, this was one of my, my focuses in, in my research. So the other point, as I've already mentioned, is through cytokine regulation. And so in addition to um, having regulation of the amount of the cytokine that's being produced, we have molecules known as suppressors of cytokine signaling. And what they do is they actually modulate how a given cell interprets what that cytokine is telling them to do. Well, I mean, it's kind of cool, right? So, so um, in essence, um, you know, I could get a phone call from someone and they say, go streak in the middle of Santa Fe College, right? And I go, wait a second, that's a bad idea, right? So, so our suppressors of cytokine signaling are intracellular <laughs> molecules, and I've always not been able to laugh when I say that, but, but you have to giggle so hard that I giggle, all right? Um, but there are molecules that are on the inside of the cell, and they actually regulate how that cell responds. And, and it also limits the duration of how long that response is. So, so we have this, this series of checkpoints that keep us from actually developing the autoimmune diseases. So in my classes, I always want you to question everything, right? I don't believe anything. Um, but, but you can believe me. I'm, I'm, I, I usually, for the most part, I, I try to tell the truth when I'm, when I'm, when I'm talking about things. But regulatory T cells are, are really important in terms of preventing autoimmune disease. And how do we know? How do we know? Well, if you take them away, then mice begin to develop diseases. Um, if, you, if there are people that are born without important parts of regulatory T cells, um, one protein known as FOXP3, you don't need to know what that is today, but it's something that guides the Treg into being a Treg. If you don't have it in people, um, we develop a disease called IPEX. And usually I just say IPEX, but if you really know, immunodysregulation, polyendocrinopathy, enteropathy, X-linked syndrome. Right, is is uh, IPEX, but it's actually a, a, a horrendous disease. Um, it's X-linked, so who gets affected more, men or women? Well, men get affected more because they only got one of them. So, so that so that so that so the men get these these horrible diseases and they ultimately uh, die. But even if you have, um, if even if you have FOXP3, then some people don't have Tregs that work just right. So, um, so, so what we can then do is maybe fix these regulatory T cells so that they then work better, right? So that's one of the things that um, we're, striving, we're striving and we're working on. So as a postdoc, um, we, we work a bit on regulatory T cells. And, and as we're talking science and, and, um, and just giving some background on, on immunology, um, 
T cells in general are made in the thymus. Um, and the thymus is an organ that's right above the heart. And, um, and, and that's where our T cells um, develop their antigenic specificity. And all that means is that they, they now know what they're going to respond to. So they go from double negative to double positive, and they go to single positive. And then that just means that, because um, immunologists need things to write hard tests on. So to accommodate us, the immune system has these proteins that go up and down so that we can ask questions on exams. <laughs> yes, and people do laugh this time, so that's good. Um, so there are two things that are associated with T cells, a protein known as CD4 and a protein known as CD8. And, and these two proteins, CD4 and CD8, um, the cells are first double negative because they're not T cells yet. Um, so they don't have CD4 or CD8 on their surface. Then they don't know whether they're going to ultimately become a CD4 or a CD8, so then they express CD4 and CD8 on their surface. And then through the magic of television, actually as a process of positive and negative selection, they ultimately become either CD4 or CD8, so then they become single positive. So we then go out, then into our bodies, we get a combination of CD4, CD8s, but then we also get these regulatory T cells, as, as, I, as I've already mentioned, that control autoimmunity. And, and what do they do? Well, these guys in red, those are our regulatory T cells. These are our normal conventional cells. If you activate T cells, then one of the things that they do is they proliferate. So CPM stands for counts per minute. So we can actually measure proliferation by the amount of radioactivity these cells incorporate. And then as we add in more regulatory T cells, the guys in red, then what we see is that proliferation goes down, right? So, so again, how do you prevent autoimmunity? Well, you keep the immune system in check, right? So these regulatory T cells are one way in which we're keeping the immune system in check. And I'm actually going to skip this slide because it says the same types of things, but it, it'll, it'll take a little while to explain. Um, but in addition to controlling proliferation, if we look at this guy right here, which is our regulatory T cells being added, then what you can see is that our regulatory T cells can also turn off certain cytokines, right? So we had T cells cause autoimmunity. Cytokines can drive autoimmunity. So now we have regulatory T cells and they can directly affect the activation of the T cells <coughs> that, well, and again, now these T cells could be helpful, right? Um, but, but they have the ability to control T cell proliferation and they also have the ability to turn off some of those cytokines that are involved in driving the disease. So this becomes something that, that's important. And and you get this for free because I still have some a, a little bit of time. So can I ask a question? Is that allowed? Okay, awesome. So <coughs> Tregs are great in terms of preventing autoimmunity because they turn off immune responses. Can you think of one example where Tregs would be downright awful? And I'm not afraid of uncomfortable silence. <laughs> oh yeah, yes. Um, like if you have to get like an accurate CAT scan or um, some sort of heart disease. Absolutely. So, so, the, qu so the answer was, um, so if you have a bacterial disease or a viral disease, um, now the, immune, the regulatory T cells can go in and turn off that response to the virus or the cancer. And, and that actually, can and does happen because um, those, those <coughs> crazy viruses have figured out ways, some of them, so, so basically the immune system, you want to mount immune response against a virus, right? Viruses or, or infectious viruses or pro viruses that cause us problems, cause us problems because they figured out ways to get around that immune response, right? So one of the things that they can do is that they can turn off the immune response, right? So they can, they can make 
regulatory T cells work a little bit better to kind of turn off the immune system in that area, right? It doesn't happen all the time, but it can happen. So viruses, what, are, what is another example of something that regulatory T cells will be absolutely awful at? It's along the same lines as, as a virus. I mentioned it earlier. Go ahead. Cancer, absolutely. Okay. You're absolutely. It's not a. It's not a trick. Everyone thinks that I'm. I don't trick questions. No, but in terms of cancers, increase. So there have been numerous studies that have actually shown that there are increases in regulatory T cells within solid tumors. So basically, the cells go in to kill the tumor, and now the regulatory T cells are turning them off. Right. So so everything that we talk about in terms of immune responses is is our levels of balance. Right, um, so so the regulatory T cells can turn off T cell responses, turn off certain cytokines, and so we also have suppressors or cytokine signaling. So I'm not going to say this is complicated because because when whenever someone says things are complicated, then that that gives everyone permission to not pay attention, right? So it's it's something that's that's commonplace. So you have um, Janus kinases. And, and so whenever things work in the immune system, and, and, and so we have computers, right, and they operate through a binary code, yes, no, yes, no, yes, 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 no, 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 right, right, ones and zeros, right? So the immune system to a large extent also works like with something like that, ons and offs, ones and zeros, phosphatases, kinases, right? Phosphatases take off phosphate groups, kinases put them on. So the jack stat pathway, we have genus kinases that then regulate transcription factors called stats that basically go to the nucleus and then tell the cell to do something. So up here we have cytokines. And remember the cytokines are a part of regulating, uh, you know, ini initiating immune responses, regulating immune responses. And the cytokine binds to the cytokine receptor. And then we have genus kinases that then cause stats to be phosphorylated, then those stats then go to the nucleus and do things. So this is an important part of the immune system if we want to heighten, but it's also an important target if we want to turn things off. So I actually took out a slide, um, but we have jack stat signaling and the stat goes to the nucleus and it, and it, and it, it, it regulates program programming to tell the, the cell to do something. Generally speaking, that program is going to be largely to induce some inflammation or you know, we have to deal with some problem. But one of the things that that stat also does is it causes the generation of a protein known as suppressor of cytokine signaling. And when it makes that protein, then that protein goes back up to the top of the water fountain that, that turned on this cascade, and then it turns that jack off, right? So you have a started immune response where you have these things that are, that are being transduced, and then the things that induce that transduction, um, that stat, then turns on a SOX protein that then turns it off. So, so uh, another word for our SOX used to be stat-induced, stat-inhibitor, one, right? Because I mean, because that's actually a much better name than, well, SOX is actually a pretty good name too, but, but stat induced stat inhibitor tells specifically what it does. So if you don't have SOX1, then guess what? These mice, just like our FOSP3 knockout mice, die within about, within in about three weeks of uncontrolled inflammatory disease. Um, and basically, you, there's infiltration of immune cells everywhere. Because again, one of the critical regulators of the immune response is no longer there. One of the critical things that keeps the immune system in check is no longer there. So these mice die. So when they're first born, um, at about one week, you can't really tell any differences. So this guy, uh, because there is some, some developmental defects, um, he hasn't developed hair, and, 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 and he is a little bit smaller, but if we go over the course of two weeks, 
then you really start to see that these mice are going to be a lot smaller. And here we have the two mice at, at, uh, at two weeks. This is wild type or normal. This is the knockout, so he's smaller. Um, he's hating life, dude, because he's full of inflammation. And, you know, give him another week and he, he's, he's going to die. Yeah, it, it is all. Um, and, and so, and, and I do appreciate the fact that, that some may not feel comfortable with animal research, and since I am being recorded, I'll, I'll say that, but, um, and we, we do appreciate that, but, um, but we do have regulations that, that make sure that, that we treat them as eth ethically um, and as kind and responsibly as we possibly can, and, and, and all the research that we're doing is for the advancement of, of research. So, 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 um, so we do appreciate your, your concerns, and, and it's, it's just kind of part of what we do. So if you then look in one of these knockout animals, one of the things that we saw is that Treg important, right? Treg good, right? FOXP3 is a marker of Treg. When we look in happy, loving life animals, yay, we, we've got Treg, right? So that's good. When we look in the knockouts, we didn't see these cells. Right, so, so, so maybe this protein, one of the things it's doing is helping to control that population of immune cells. So is there something that we can do to maybe correct for that deficiency? So we have, um, and actually it was initiated by Howard Johnson, he designed a peptide and these are amino acids and and I, I want everyone to memorize all the amino acids that are present in this molecule. And, and also, in addition to having those amino acids, it has a palmitate group on it, which just allows it to go inside the cell to work, right? Because remember, we have cytokines on the outside. SOX proteins are on the inside, so we got to get it on the inside so it works. So we, we, so we have this peptide that goes inside, and it works like SOX. So we have animals that, that ain't got SOX. We got a protein that kind of works like sauce. We got animals that ain't got T-Rex, so maybe if we could take this peptide that looks like sauce, we could put it inside the cells, and now we can make T-Rex, right? So, so that so that was our, our question. And this is a picture, just to remind you that it goes inside the cell, and boom, there it is. They get they get fixed. So we began to treat the animals with the peptide, and so if you don't have the peptide, or we do some different combinations. Um, the animals still continued to die. But then we designed a combined treatment where we restored some of the, the T cells and we also provided the peptide. And now we have about 20% of the animals that whereas all of them died by about 16 days, a couple of them actually lived to about 80 <coughs> days, right? So, so that's actually kind of a big deal. That's actually pretty exciting. And if you were to look at the animals that are being treated, then we're able to restore some of the weight. And it just reminds you, so this is our normal mouse, healthy mouse. This is our knockout. Well, the one receiving treatment isn't gonna, this doesn't look exactly like the wild type, but it does look significantly different than the one that doesn't have the protein. And look a looky, we actually increased the number of FOXP3 positive cells as well. So, so, so we're actually we're, we're really, really excited about this. So we then said, well, is this something that could actually be relevant to a disease? And so there are some animal studies that connect the SOX deficiency. Yes. Um, what was that treatment called again? Oh, the, so the treatment was a combined therapy. So it was a combination <coughs> of the SOX peptide and also CD4 T cells, which were involved in helping to create a, an environment where we could actually be begin to develop the regulatory T cells. Other questions? Okay. So here's a picture of lupus. Um, I actually have a little, this is the color of, of lupus right here. This is actually 
Um, I received this from the Lupus Foundation, so it actually kind of, I put it on because it kind of motivates me a little bit. See a little secret trick of the trade. Um, so this is called the Malar rash. Um, and, and it is something that's indicative of lupus. And, and if we take a step back and we talk about autoimmune diseases, um, you name your autoimmune disease, every single one of them is doing this. They're all increasing. So we have to figure out what in the environment is driving these diseases. But that's, that's a side bar. That's actually, um, I'm, only, I'm, I'm running out of time, so, so we're not going to talk about some of those causes of autoimmune disease, but, but they're increasing. So, so it's really important for us to um, better understand diseases. And there are many different places where we can work to, to help to understand diseases, and, and not just at the level of um, researcher, or or a medical doctor and I'll I'll take a take a little just a little sidebar. So so when I was at the conference, I met some of the most amazing people. They were actually lupus patients. And and some of these patients were raising money. Um, someone led a um, just weekend led a um, a, a a fundraiser in in um, San, Di San Diego, and I think they raised twenty-five thousand dollars, right? I mean, that's that's just that's just amazing. Um, and and you see people at these at these conferences, and um, Selena Gomez. Do we know Selena Gomez? Yes. Um, she needed a kidney transplant. Yes. Reason being, lupus, right? So. Um, you know, I, I don't know Selena personally, but I imagine that she probably could go, could afford to go to the doctor if she needed to go to the doctor, right? Um, but the disease progressed at a point where she needed to have these, this transplant, and she's doing fine now, but if there are ways for us to detect the disease earlier, um, if there was pe people that could identify, you know, some of the, the signs, you know, this malar rash of, of lupus, so we can, we can actually have an intervention before it actually progresses to the point where, where it destroys the kidneys, right? So, and, and, and there are many ways that we can contribute to, to, to helping in that area. And I was gonna go fast. Um, so, who gets affected by lupus? Lupus affects women in the prime of their life. Nine out of 10 people that are affected by lupus are women, and they're usually women that are childbearing age, which, which sometimes negatively impacts, oftentimes negatively impacts their ability to, to bear children, right? So, so this is a disease that, that um, is near and dear. So, one of the questions that we asked was, well, if SOX1 has been associated in these rodent studies with lupus, then could it be a connection with SOX1 and, and, and patients? And what we actually saw was that in lupus patients, if we're looking at relative expression of how much SOX is being expressed, within the patients, there was much less. And it didn't matter whether or not they were receiving steroids or not. Pregnisone is a steroid. So we, we saw that there's a deficiency. So, so having said that, we then went back into an animal model and we, we tested um, mice that spontaneously develop a lupus-like pathology for the ability of the peptide to prevent lupus-like disease. And one of the things that we saw <coughs> was so these lesions are, are lesions that are developed in these animals spontaneously, and they're a little bit similar, or a lot similar to that malar rash that you see, or the rash that can be all over. And what we saw was that the peptide actually inhibited or delayed the onset of these, of these rashes and also reduced the frequency of the rashes that were occurring in the animals. The other thing that we saw was that, so we, we, so just taking a step back, so 
basically one of the causes of immune autoimmune diseases is that you have immune cells that start, but they don't get turned off, right? There's a, there's a good start, but it's not a good finish. So what we saw the peptide actually did was it actually reduced the amount of immune cells in these animals. So, so basically, it's having an effect because it reduced the rashes, um, it reduced the amount of immune cells that are causing disease. We believe that it had an effect in lupus nephritis, um, but we're actually redoing experiments now to actually test that again. Um, so so we, we think that this is something that, that's, that's very promising. So, so SOX1 plays an essential role in the regulation of, of Tregs, which are, are also something that regulates immune responses. Um, we have a peptide that, that um, can, can mimic SOX1 and it's actually been shown to have effects in regulating immunity. And, and we think that SOX1 medics may actually have an effect in the treatment of autoimmune diseases. And so these are my, my girls. Um, you can see that she's full of <laughs> personality. That, that's her most of the time. And um, I will take questions. I actually have a few, a few minutes um, because it ends at 50, right? So I finished about four minutes early. Oh, no, you have time. Oh, I have time? Okay. All right, so we have actually, we're actually working on a number of different projects. And, and I do have slides, but I'm, I'll, I'll just talk and then, I'll, and then we can take some questions. Um, so we've actually treated um, eyes of, of so... Uveitis is a disease that is a comorbid, co is, is, is associated with, with lupus. So, so not only do you have damage in kidneys, but it also can damage the eyes. It can also uh, damage uh, the heart. And, and these are all things that are also associated with inflammation. Um, I always have a trick question in my class. And it's not really a trick question because I tell everyone that I'm going to ask it. Um, but I, I don't say exactly how I'm going to ask it. Um, inflammation is really, really important, right? Inflammation is the way that we clear pathogens. Inflammation is the way that we clear <coughs> cancers and viruses. Chronic inflammation is always bad because what it does is if I wanted to play basketball and the hoop's way up there and I want to do a slam dunk, if there was a big stool that I could climb up on, now it makes it so that I can jump up and, and slam the basketball, right? In terms of autoimmunity, inflammation, chronic inflammation is the big step, right? So, 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 it, so it increases the, the baseline so that it becomes easier for immune cells to do the things that they're not supposed to be doing. So, so chronic inflammation is associated with type 2 diabetes. Um, is associated with uh, cardiovascular diseases, heart damage. Um, it's projected by the year uh, 2040 that, and that's what, 20 years from now, um, one third of all Americans will have either type 2 diabetes or, or heart disease. One third of the, the entire population. Um, it, it is at epidemic proportions right now, right? So, and, and these are, and actually these are things that we can actually help. We can actually help these things. But, but inflammation is driving those things. Something else that inflammation is driving is, is, is this uveitis. So what we have tested, we tested the hypothesis that if, if, we, if we inject the peptide into, a, into an animal, it has an effect. What if we apply the peptide topically to the eye? And so we induced uveitis in, um, in mice, and, and the peptide actually prevented the uveitis. Yeah, which is which is pretty exciting, and it's like, oh, it's not going to work. It's not going. It, it works. It's, it works amazingly well, right? Um, so I, I was talking to um, one of my congressmen, and um, I, if I give too many details, you'll know which congressman it is. But anyway, we're talking. We're having a good conversation, and um, but he is a veterinarian by trade, so so you can you can figure out who that congressperson is. Um, so we're talking about this uveitis, and he says, well. Uveitis is impossible to treat in horses. 
And I go, yeah? He says, yeah. So we're actually running a, a clinical trial right now testing the ability of the peptide to, um, to, to treat uveitis in horses that have been diagnosed with uveitis. And it actually is, is, is working pretty well. So we're, we're excited about that. Um, something else that we're working on is that we s you saw how the peptide reduced the amount of lesions. Um, we are we're wondering if we m formulate the peptide, and, and in addition to that, we're making better peptides, and we're you know so we think that there's something important here. But if we have a formulation that we can apply topically, maybe you don't have to inject the peptide. Maybe you can just rub a little cream on someone that has a rash, right? So that's something that that we're also thinking about and working on. And I I do have more and more slides, but I'm I'm going I'm going to and unless you just really want me to to continue, so I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.